All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my presentation? Yes, Marco, we can see it. Well, should we start? Yeah, take it away. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Here is Marco Sangrador, and with the help of Victor, Dr. Coser, we're going to present this case of a clival lesion. We present the case of a 27-year-old woman who initiated her symptoms one year prior to her admission to her hospital with a episodic holocranial headache, which was initially treated as a migraine with no adequate remission of, of the symptoms. However, after nine months of treatment, the headache was worse and not responding to mild analgesics. As past med medical history, she presented in 2016 with a multinodular goiter, which was treated with a thyroid biopsy, but no diagnosis and proper follow-up was performed. Uh, she is a hypothyroid with levothyroxine substitution. And in 2017, two episodes of cholecholithiasis treated with two ERCPs was performed. And in 2020, she presented with mild COVID. At physical examination, she presented no alterations on general, general examination. In neurological examination, a left abduction palsy and a diminished gag reflex were present. Um, also, an ataxic gait with left lateral pulsion. No other relevant neurological alterations were observed. As for the neuroimaging fine. Yeah. Marco, do you mind going back? I'm going to ask one of my residents. Sure. Right here, as I, as I, we try to learn Ivyline for them to be prepared because they got to have to eventually take the oral boards. I see Dr. Montessera, are you there? Hala, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Ala. I'm just so trying you, to unmute. Yeah, thank you, Hala. So you <laughs> heard the presentation. She's young. You know, uh, you see the past medical history right there, the goiter. Uh, right. You know, the endoscopic uh, procedures in COVID in 2020, but the findings and the physical examination that Marcos just pointed out right now, they're very telling. When you hear an abduction palsy, the minish hack reflex, you know, and potential cerebellum problems, where would you like to consider pointing this lesion to be? Well, uh, I know that apparently the um, um, topic is talking about the clival lesion, but uh, given the presentation of having a sixth nerve palsy and a lower cranial nerve palsy plus cerebral or signs, I would, uh, I would definitely think of a posterior fossa lesion. And I would think of uh, a lesion causing compression, uh, starting at least from the pontum uh, uh, medullary junction uh, I'm sorry, from the uh, pontum mesencephalic junction all the way down to the uh, medulla, um, you know, affecting the safe and the lower cranial nerves as well uh, with some sort of lateral extension to be able to affect the cerebellum. Uh, so uh, I would definitely think of an uh, anterior uh, uh, posterior fossa lesion or posterior fossa lesion located in an anterior aspect of it. Uh, I think of a clival lesion, I'll think of a vitroclival lesion, and I think of a CPA lesion as well, uh, affecting all these cranial nerves and the cerebellum. Beautiful. Marcos, one little quick question right here. Yeah. The left uh, abduction pulse, was that acute? Was that gradual? And how long has it been going on? It presented on? three months before she, she was admitted to her, to her hospital. So it was going on for a while, because that's what I was thinking. I was thinking about something that is in the fibers, and even without seeing the pictures or the, the presentation, something that erodes through the Rellos Canal, something that is going to potentially, because that's, I don't know why the cranial nerve number six is so resilient, even to posterior cranial fossa lesions and stuff, but something that erodes through, you know, the actual fibers, as, as, as Alas, Dr. Montessori just said, that's where I begin to point, even without knowing what the background is. These are important things, Allah, by the way, for the oral boards, because they're going to ask you something. They're going to present a case like this, and they're going to ask, what are you thinking about? They want to make sure that you're thinking exactly the way you did. They're not going to tell you that there's a clival lesion. They're presenting you. They won't show you any pictures. They just want to know that you can identify general themes right off the bat. Um, sure. Gabriel, any, and I see Gabriel Vargas right there. Gabriel, anything else to add? 
to a residence uh, for, for teaching purposes? Uh, no, I think that this is one of the things that uh, make us uh, the neuro uh, science and the neurosurgery uh, spectacular to analyze. Now, where is the exactly place of the lesion? And uh, I agree with you that uh, this kind of uh, defects of uh, um, cranial nerves uh, give us the idea that the lesion should be somewhere in the place where you say mm -hmm. so. I love it. This is a very, very good teaching point. I'm sorry, Marcus. I don't know if, if Victor, the Dr. Alcocer, had anything else to add for, for the resident teaching at this point or anything else. Uh, hi, good morning. No, I agree in honor in other and all this uh, consideration. I completely agree because the sex, the sixth nerve is difficult to localize because have a, a long uh, a portion with uh, is affected. And I completely agree. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Good. All right. I'm sorry, Mark. I just wanted to use that as a teaching point because these are the things that we can cement in our minds. Keep going. Sure. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Victor, too. Well, we performed an MRI in which we can see a midline lesion that was occupying the retrocellular interpedicular prepontine and anterior medial cisterns. Uh, we also can see a caudal displacement and apparent invasion of the brainstem. In a T1 weighted image, we can see a hypointense uh, lesion with small fossae of hyperintensity that corresponds to intratumoral hemorrhage. We turn to the axial, axial section in which compression of the fourth ventricle and invasion of the middle and upper pons are observed. In a T2 weighted image, we can see how the basil, basilar artery is heavily displaced towards the right, which is an essential consideration when we think on the surgical approach we're going to choose. We can see similar findings in, in the T in the axial section. We can see a Hyper intense lesion. In a post contrast image, we can see an heterogeneous enhancement with central hyper intensity that can correspond to intratermal hemorrhage, as, as was commented before. And, and we have, uh, Marco, we have a meet, Agar Wow, which is one of our neuroradiologists, right here also available and I don't know Amit if you have any any comments to make about this lesion it's very daunting and I was immediately concerned about the basilar location of course. Sure Dr. Q so I just have two points to add first of all is the very bright signal of this lesion it looks almost like CSF and that is something which is characteristic for chordomas the, these lesions tend to be very bright in fact the brightest of almost all the skull based lesions we see the second thing the, about this lesion is that those bright signal what we saw on T1 images, those, those could represent just this destroyed bone rather than hemorrhage as well. So those are the two points. Third one ad additional thing is that there is scalloping of the anterior surface of brainstem or thumb printing as we call it. And that mm -hmm. again is a very characteristic finding in cardiomas. So this imaging, this is a classic case, classic imaging case for cardioma. Beautiful. Um, Victor, I, I was just thinking about this, obviously with the, um, with the basilar being on the right side and, and more anterior, if I, if I saw it correctly, it's to the right side and in the anterior portion of the tumor, you probably see it, I, I think that's the figure. That's the way, yes. excellent, right there. So I was I immediately, of course, I always teach the residents, the danger zones, you know, that where you got to be careful and not get into a perforator or, or a branch or, or something like that. Any, any thoughts, any teaching points for our residents as you're thinking surgically about this? Uh, I think the most important uh, uh, in this, this uh, uh, situation or this uh, tumor is uh, the uh, the the portion the the osseous portion is completely intact. Mm -hmm. Only have a, a small portion in in the in the superoclival and in 
in the, in the sea, the, the indention, the, cl the clivus. And the other uh, lesion is completely intradural uh, uh, situation. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the bacillar is completely uh, invited in the superior portion of the, of the tumor, uh, it, specifically in the, in the tip, the, the bacillar. And of course, the, 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 is the, uh, the, the basal is involved, but in the inferior portion, I think have a, a good uh, uh, plane of the dissection. Beautiful point, Victor. I was thinking about it because developmentally, we think that these lesions come from the notochord. And we've done a fair amount of work in the laboratory with this lesion. I see, I see Olu right now that is working with Rachel in an animal model in a laboratory where actually they put in these tumors in the sacrum as well as in the clivus and, and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and normally when they, the notochord is going to be at the center of the clivus, the bone, and they begin to expand and begin to erode the bone, but this is actually a, a very, very good tissue. But that means that it's going to be even more daunting to try to get to some sort of anterior scovis approach, you know, in any way, shape, or form. You know, that's a very good point. And I don't know if were we able to get a CT scan, Victor, by any chance, or Marcos, or anything that we had in there? Uh, for questions, uh, for because of the time, I didn't didn't add the the CT scan, doctor. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, 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 no problem. But, but I really, I think that Victor brings a very good yeah, point yeah. about, you know. Yeah, okay, is, is the sitting can is 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 possible, but but uh, is the completely uh, determination about the, the osseous invasion, but yeah, uh, the 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 clivus is completely uh, not affected, only Amazing. the superior portion. So you can have a small little window to begin to yeah. do your bone work if that's what you want to do, and I, I think you can okay. see it in those sagittal. Okay. picture, but you're right. It's amazing. We also show a tractography in which we can see the corticospinal tract, which is caudally displaced behind the tumor. Uh, as we can see, the patient has no, no motor deficit. Amazing. We, we want to present uh, as a quick review the this article that was published in 2017 by Dr. Secker, where he proposed a new preoperative grading system for chordomas, in which he he tells us that we must analyze tumor size, the site of the tumor, vascular involve, involvement, intradural invasion, and tumor regrowth after prior treatment, in which we will have a punctuation between two and 25, in which our patient was in a, uh, she had 13 points. So this is gonna, help us decide the approaches. And we can see how patients with punctuations like ours, we have a less percentage of complete resection, uh, a higher percentage of complications, and least uh, uh, less progression fee free outcomes. And in some reports, well, most of the reports we found that reported brainstem and intradural invasion, we can see that uh, a complete resection of these lesions is impossible due to the high risk of, of uh, irreversible neurological deficit. So I'm gonna present a quick review, a quick, a quick anatomic review. We must remember that the clivus is a portion of the, of the skull base that is formed by the sphenoid and the, and the occipital bone. The limits are in its upper side, the posterior planar process and the dorsum celli. Inferiorly, the anterior border of the foramen magnum and laterally, we have the petroclival fissure. We can divide the clivus in, an, in the cranial perspective, in the upper clivus that goes from the posterior planar processes to the Dorellus canal. After that, the middle clivus from the Dorellus canal to the glossopharyngeal meatus located in the jugular, jugular foramen. And the lower clivus goes from the glossopharyngeal meatus to the anterior border of the foramen, foramen magnum. And from an extracranial or endoscopic perspective, we're gonna have the, the same divisions, the upper, middle, and lower clivus, which go from the anterior fossa floor to the sphenoid fossa, to the cellar floor, then from the cellar floor to the uh, floor of the sphenoid, sphenoid sinus, and from the coenic to the anterior border of the foramen magnum. 
Well, we decided to perform an endonasal endoscopic approach. We placed the patient in a supine position with a slight head deflection of 15 degrees to the right. We performed neurophysiological -physi monitoring from cranial nerve 3 to 12, and neuronavigation was also performed in this case. Can I, can I mention something I saw that beautiful? You go back to that picture. That's something that I teach the residents um, for these cases as to why I also prefer to pin them. You can see a little bit of deviation. So you're working on the patient. You're probably standing on the right side. You probably have someone else working with you. You tilted the head a little bit, you know, toward the patient's left, looking up a little bit and elevated the head so that way you allow gravity also to drip the blood a little bit and to be able to come in at a very comfortable angle with the endoscope. That's a beautiful procedure. I tried to teach the residents a little bit about that position, comfortable for the patient, comfortable for the surgeon, just in case if you're gonna be there for hours of hours. If the patient is looking up straight, you know, and the surgeon is like this, after four or five hours, your back begins to kill you and it's not very comfortable and also much more difficult to have four hands working. So I just wanna make sure that I come in on that beautiful position, just the head, because that's where the surgery starts. So the surgery started a long time ago when you guys begin to plan, but in the upper room physically, it starts with an excellent positioning right there. Okay. Uh, Victor, sorry. Yeah, Robert. go ahead, Victor. Yeah. I figured, okay. yeah, go ahead. And another uh, consideration is about the, the level or the uh, situation of the lesion, because in, in the, in the, in the um, anterior school base, we need a uh, extension mm -hmm. and is in the in the lower clival is flexion. Yeah, beautiful. Well, I'm gonna present the surgical video. We started the nasal phase with lock installation of epinephrine and the nasal septal mucosa. After that, a left middle turbinectomy in order to achieve a wider surgical corridor was performed. We then grafted a pediculated nasal septal flap which was stored instead of the coena, we stored it in the maxillar sinus as the middle clivus must be free of any obstruction in order to perform the, the drilling. We performed, uh, we identified the sphenoid, sphenoid rostrum and the ostia and drilling of the anterior sphenoid floor was performed. We can see here the posterior septectum is completed and the neuronavigation of the sphenoid, sphenoid sinus. We started drilling along all the, the sphenoid sinus, the nasopharyngeal mucosa and phasia were dissected free in order to achieve a proper visualization of the middle and lower clivus. I'm gonna jump a little bit further. And, and I wanna comment right here. The other thing is a beautiful two millimeter diamond drill bit that allows you to do beautiful hemostasis. I love that drill and sometimes they in, in our uh, country they like to use the sonopit I, i'm not quite sure i am a big fan of the sonopit you can't control the same amount of hemostasis like you do right there you see the white i mean it allows you to control hemostasis better control your drilling and that diamond drill bit rarely is gonna injure the dura if unless you plunge vigorously victor anything to comment about this technique of your drill right there in Mexico, it's just only possible with a diamond uh, is mm -hmm. the drill. We gotcha. don't have a, a, a sonopet or mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. uh, device for the remove bond. I love it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, once we resected the sphenoid, the, the cellar floor, we started drilling the clival recess. We drilled laterally in order to achieve control of the paraclival and the paracellar ICA. You can see here how we are drilling in the lateral portion of the clival recess. We performed a clivectomy until the clival dura was observed. We can see how carries and rangers helped us retire, um, to take off all the, all the bone that was obstructing our view toward the dura. We can see here how the, the, the proclival carotid has been mobilized and further drilling is being performed. One of the most important steps in this, in the, the approach that we want to show you is that we performed a posterior clinoidal, uh, uh, posterior clinoidectomy, sorry. We started this by opening the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. 
making a sharp cut between the pituitary gland and the ICA. We can see here how the par par paracellar ligaments are a key landmark that must be identified and cut in order to achieve a proper access to the posterior clinoids. We can see here how dissection is being made through the cavernous sinus as a left transcavernous approach and the left clinoid, posterior clinoid is being resected. And after that, the right posterior clinoid is being resected. We perform this in order to achieve access to the interpeduncular and retroinfundibular portion of the tumor. Here we started debulking the portion of the tumor that was located in the middle clivus. A dural opening was already performed. We can see a firm consistency tumor that was resected with ring curettes and aspir uh, ultrasonic aspirator. We found a very hard tumor that was very adhered to the brainstem, as we can see here. The most anterior portions of the tumor were kind of easily resected, but there has to be quite a blunt dissection in the most posterior part in order to protect the brainstem. And, and Marcos and Victor, quick question, right? Here. I love the dissection, it's absolutely stunning. I don't know if people realize, two quick questions. Tell the audience right here, how long did it take you to make sure that you drill all this and you carefully dissected the posterior clinus? Because of course you present the abbreviated version, but I want people to understand this is a very patient type of work that is very meticulous. And we're seeing an abbreviated uh, uh, version right here. So how long did it take for you to properly get there? And the second one is, what kind of maneuvers are you giving the patient? Are you giving Vasalva maneuvers to try to bring the tumor to the front? Or what other things are you doing? If you can please tell the audience, that would be great. Okay, uh, sorry. For the first part, is a approach properly and is the clivectomy uh, around two or three hours. Yeah. Only for the, uh, remove all the clivos, all the, the, the posterior clinoid and whatever. And in the tumor only remove about aspiration and dissection. Only no use uh, uh, any maneuvers like uh, Mansalva or whatever. That's amazing, beautiful. But I just want to get people to, uh, to get a sense. It was three hours of work before he got into the tumor. You know, now he's got into the tumor is another few hours. I mean, we're, we're seeing him, you know, right here, but this, you have to be extraordinarily patient and meticulous. As you can see, they're using their bipolar right there. Keep going, Marcus. I'm sorry. I just wanted people to get a sense of the beauty of this approach that you guys did. Yeah, don't worry. Here is another important key point that we want to show you. We performed an, another opening of the anterior wall of the, of the cavernous situs and the medial wall in the right side. This was in order to perform an interdural pituitary transposition or lateralization, medialization in this case. We have to identify the inferior hypophyseal artery and the par paracellular ligaments. We have to cut and coagulate all of these structures. So we can see here, we identified liliquous membranes in the depth. We are cutting here all the par paracellular ligaments. You can see here, liliquous membrane. Here is a cadaveric dissection in which we can see the inferior hypervisual artery, which has already been co coagulated. And the first landmark we will see is the superior cerebellar, cere cerebellar artery. So here we, we got access to the retroinfundibular retro portion and all the portion of the lesion that was located in the interpeduncular cistern. And resection continued as previously mentioned. We can see the midbrain, that which which had a important peel invasion of the lesion, and the reconstruction was performed in a multi-layer fashion. We use inlay and unlay dural substitute, followed by a fascia graft and a fat graft, and tissue adherent with a Foley catheter. So this is the the surgical video. Unbelievable. Wow. Beautiful, Victor, beautiful. Post-operative imaging, Thank we can you. see how an adequate tumor decompression was performed in the lower 
lower end of the pons and the middle and upper pons. However, as we told you, um, complete resections in lesions like this that invade the brainstem is practically impossible because uh, severe deficits can, can appear after the surgery. In the sagittal section, we can see how most of the tumor was resected, mm -hmm. but here the, the part that was invading most of the brainstem could not be resected safely, so it stayed there. Uh, pathology reported a conventional chordoma. We can see the fusiliferous cells, which are uh, big cells that are that have a really clear or eosinophilic cytoplasm that are called fusiliferous cells. We can see in chemistry that, that was positive for EMA for pro, uh, S100 protein and cytokeratins. A patient presented a CSF leak secondary to hydrocephalus one week after surgery. We have to perform a ventricular peritoneal shunt and an endonasal revision, which um, in which we perform no further maneuvers because the 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 shunt resolved the the CSF leak. For uh, after that, the patient was treated with radiotherapy, a total dosage of 66 grays in 33 fractions, and the last follow up was just the, oh, sorry, here is, yeah, the 10th of September, and the patient was asymptomatic. We're waiting for a new MRI, but the, the clinical outcome so far has been very, very good. Beautiful case, Marcos and Victor, absolutely amazing. I see <laughs> several questions right here. I saw already Ala and Nolo with their hands up, but before I go to them, I saw Dr. Jen Tuft, too, right here, who's our, one of the, our world expert neuropathologists. Uh, uh, Mark, are you there on the line? Any, anything to comment about these beautiful stains? No. Any uh, point for our residents? Actually, very good. Um, the one thing I would comment if you go to the stains, a lot of people know the buzzword brachiuri and think that if without a brachiuri, that you need a brachiuri stain. You really don't. The brachiuri stain is positive in these. It's supportive. It's specific. But really on all of them, if they're S100 and EMA positive, you're, you're done. Or if it's uh, S100 and keratin positive, you're also basically done. The main thing you want to separate it out from uh, pathologically would be a um, chondrosarcoma. And those will be S100 positive, but they won't have keratin or EMA. Another lesion that can look like this is a cordoid meningioma, which will be EMA positive, but negative for keratin and S100. So though um, brachiary can help, it is, it's not necessary. And the staining on this was absolutely beautiful as well as the histology. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Genta. And you can see you know, uh, Marcos and, and Victor, tons of comments right here. Beautiful, beautiful case. So I'm gonna pivot right now to Dr. Akinduro, who's one of our uh, surgeons and clinical scientists who's got a grant funded for... You may be muted, Olu, or you're frozen. Okay. Yeah, there you are, we yeah. hear you now. Okay, I didn't know if it was you frozen or me frozen, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, that was a beautiful case. I mean, that was tough. And I mean, I was on the edge of my seat just watching it. Um, and I mean, you mentioned that, I mean, when they're attached to the brainstem like that, there's really no way to, uh, to get rid of that tumor. And uh, that kind of go, I kind of wanted to plug in some of the research that Q was talking about. Uh, there really is, are no animal models for uh, skull based tumors. Um, so that's one of the things that we're working on right now um, with Cordoma. And also we're uh, targeting actually kind of in the same uh, lineage that Dr. Gentop just mentioned as far as brachiuri, uh, brachiuri yap, that whole axis is always positive in these and always overexpressed. So our goal is to use some um, microparticles targeting that pathway to treat these. So hopefully in these cases where you can't take all of the tumor, maybe at the time of surgery, you can just leave these particles that release the drug over a long period of time and hopefully it makes them more sensitive to radiation and prevents them com from coming back. But I mean, beautiful case, but as you can see, you know, we still uh, need more and that comes from, from the lab. So hopefully uh, we can all work together in the future and make these things happen. Thank you. I, I love your description, Olo, being at the age of because that's how I was. 
Also, I think people <laughs> people who do this work realize the danger and the, you know, a lot of people look, oh, they look nice, but people who are there like Victor being there, you know, in the middle of this case, Dr. Alcocer, it's just you, your adrenaline, your heart rate is beating at a pace that it's difficult to describe and you still have to maintain calm and take patience and dissect and stuff. Absolutely stunning. Allah. Well, thank you for uh, presenting such an interesting and a challenging case and um, um, I'm fascinated by how you kind of like preserved uh, the basilar artery, given the course of the basilar artery is usually not a straight course. It's kind of like uh, turning around and then you kind of like kept the tumor all around uh, the vessel. It's uh, pretty impressive. I'm just wondering uh, about the pituitary gland function slash DI post-op. Uh, it's not uncommon with pituitary gland transposition and hemitransposition, especially in a medial trajectory to have some sort of DI uh, at least. So just wondered uh, what was the uh, pituitary uh, gland outcome and was there any DI in that case? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. The, the patient didn't present DA. Uh, she she persisted with a hypothyroidism that was seen before the surgery, but no new deficits were were added. Beautiful, gorgeous, Thank good, you. 